What is going on YouTube? I am Lamont at large and today I got a very special guest with me, uh, Max. Howdy folks. How yeah. y'all is? Never seen this man ever in my life. Never ever. No. Uh, my buddy Max here has a YouTube channel. It's called Max Adventures. Uh, he, he vlogs. I, do, I go to small towns. Uh, we're right now we're in Sherman, Texas. That's about you know 50,000 people, give or take. By far the largest town I'll ever go to. But it's mostly those towns from 1,500 to 5,000 people. I try to show interesting facts about the town, things that happen in the town, why the town's in the state it is at the current time. Uh, Stuff like that. Yeah, towns that you would fly right over, yeah. drive right through, you would never visit in a million years. Uh, the link to his channel will be in the description box below. Definitely check it out. I approve. And like Max said, today we're in Sherman, Texas. So we're going to show the dark side of Sherman, the not so dark side of Sherman. Also, Denison, we're going to go up to Denison. Yeah, this little metro area, Sherman Denison, is kind of north of Dallas, about, a, about an hour north of Dallas, around yeah. the Red River. Yeah, so people would never think that bad things have happened in the Sherman Denison area, but. Uh, they have, and they happen all over. That's yeah. what we're here to show you. All right, let's get right into it. Yeah, we made it to downtown Denison. It's a quaint little downtown right on the Red River, across from Oklahoma. It's also the. Uh, birthplace of Dwight Eisenhower, which we're going to check out his place in just a second. But what I wanted to show you here at the old Hotel Denison is a relic of the old Cold War. Check this out. This was an old fallout shelter. Uh, so if you were, were born after the 80s, you probably don't know what this would even be, but back in the Cold War with Russia, uh, we, you know, when I was a kid, we had to do uh, drills. Nuclear, if we were to be attacked by nuclear weapons, what would we do? And we go through the whole drill of getting on your hands and knees on your desk and you have fallout shelters and things of that nature. So one thing else I wanted to show you here, this is what's kind of cool about these old buildings. Look at how worn this is. So this is the walkway here. Look at how many people have went across the... Oh, that's that's from them that's wearing it down? From, yeah, it's just from wearing down over all the travel over that one section. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's funny. All right. Who is this right here? So, Denison is known as the home of heroes. Uh, this is the, like I said, the birthplace of White Eisenhower, our president. And also this guy right here, a lot of you guys remember this. This is a very heroic man. This is Sully Sullenberg. And uh, if you remember back in 2009, he actually landed this airplane in the Hudson River and all 155 people on board were, uh, were saved. You know I mean, could you imagine if another pilot would have been on this flight? This would have been a you know aviation uh, catastrophe probably you know so this man right here saved all those people on board a true hero and uh, I think now he's actually uh, he went through the Air Force Academy was a uh, uh, Air Force pilot I think he was first went in as a uh, one of the first glider pilot program back in the 60s or the early 70s I think he graduated here in 69 but um, yeah man this guy unbelievable uh landing that plane in the hudson with not a single soul perishing it just blows my mind you know and they, and they had made a uh a bi not, not, i don't want to say like a big deal but it became a talking point about pilots pay and how surprisingly little they get paid now yeah, I mean, at the time he was making a little over 100 grand a year but considering what he did by saving those people yeah no i mean uh, a good pilot that can do that i mean they're, what is their worth you know I mean if you're trained well enough where you can land a plane with no engines uh, what happened is on takeoff uh, the engines both engines sucked up birds and it, it uh, took out both engines and he actually flew that thing they told him to turn around and come back he's like I have no power like I'm I'm landing this thing in the Hudson you know send some boats out and uh, he landed it perfectly in the river so unbelievable what do you think the passengers on the plane got for compensation because they can sue I mean, I don't know. I would hope, uh, you know, your life being spared would mean enough to me. Uh, but, you know, it is a sue happy nation. Are so. you trying to tell me that you wouldn't have sued if you no, were on that plane? I would plane? not have sued. I would be very thankful for this man for saving my life. I would have been on the phone with the lawyer as we were plunging towards the Hudson. I'm sure there was there were several people that did that. I'll sure both my phones. Did do that. Yeah, I, I'd have had the, the Texas hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I will hammer, hammer, hammer until I get every penny I deserve. <laughs> no, that's a good man though. Really good man. So, as far as we can tell, this is about the location. We're six miles north of Denison, Texas. And 
these woods, January 22nd of 1878, was the very first reported flying saucer. That's right, folks. Encounters of the third kind. Took place right here in these woods. There was a guy named John Martin, not to be confused with John Martian. LOL. Honey. Yes, LOL. He was hunting in these woods. We're right on the Red River. The Red River runs right behind us here, right on the Oklahoma border. And on January 22nd, about 6.30 at night, that's going to be dark at 6.30 at night. Just, you know, just dark. How much moonshine is involved in this story? I don't know, but this is what was reported. Now, he could have been a moonshiner. He was in the woods moonshining instead of hunting. I don't know. But he claims to have seen the first flying saucer. He says that at first it looked like an orange, like an orange ball of light. He said it got closer and closer, and he said he could see it was getting larger in size. And by the time it was up above him, like in these trees, he was looking through the trees. He said it was a, a disc-shaped object, and it was about the size of a house. So he first thought it was a weather balloon, because even in 1878, they had weather balloons. But it was not. There was no reported weather balloons. And he said as he, as he got closer, he could realize it was a metallic object with the orange U to it. The afterburners are half on it. So this is the first, very first place that was ever reported. And I don't know if the, you know, there was no uh, uh, Central Intelligence Agency at that time. So I don't know what happened to John Martin after this. If they hushed him away and paid him or he ended up in Red River. I'm not sure what happened. But, uh, <laughs> it was reported through the Denison Herald and then the uh, Dallas Herald at the same time. So, yeah. Who knows whatever happened to that guy? Who knows what happened to him? So I looked, I did a little research on that. And they said there, at the time there was 16 John Martins in Grayson County. So who knows which John Martin it was and where the trail ended. And we could be standing on top of his bones for all I know. Who knows? But uh, it was reported, and that was the very first report of a UFO flying saucer. Right here. We're about here. All right, folks, we're on the corner of Baden Street and Wells here in Sherman, Texas. And this was the uh, fourth murder spot of the Barrow Gang. And it's kind of unclear of which one did, who was with Clyde when he did this. It does mention that Bonnie was actually incarcerated, I believe here at the time. So she was not in the car. I think they were coming to see her or whatnot. But anyway, two members of the Barrow Gang and Clyde robbed a store that used to sit here in the corner. It was a little meat market and grocery store. And it was very uncommon for Clyde to, or the Barrow Gang to murder the common folk. It's mostly law enforcement. Um, but there was a struggle that ensued that caused this. Uh, there was a meat clerk in the back, 57-year-old Howard Hall. And he was, uh, they go in, they get a loaf of bread and some bologna. They go to pay, and one of uh, Clyde's accomplices reaches in the till and pulls out a 45. <laughs> and uh, so Mr. Hall in the back said, son, you don't want to do that. You're throwing your life away. He tries to calm him down and defuse the situation you know, or whatnot. This, uh, this upsets Clyde, so Clyde goes to strike Mr. Hall in the head with the butt of the gun. Clyde was a small guy. He was not a very big guy. Uh, so, in defense against this bigger man, as he grabs his arm, he reaches with the gun arm, hits, stops him from, from uh, striking him, and she pumps three bullets into him, you know, like stomach, chest, killing Mr. Hall. All of this was over some bologna, bread, and 60 bucks. And people say, you know, why would they rob a small store? Why not banks or somewhere that has more money? Well, a lot of people don't, don't know or, or haven't researched is Clyde had a really big drug problem. Uh, he took a lot of downers and stuff. So most likely that money was for, for drugs because uh, they, they pretty much stole gas and robbed, robbed gas and stuff. So that's not going to be for gas money. It's, yeah, Hollywood has romanticized the Bonnie and Clyde oh, yeah. characters, but these were these nothing just, but two low bit thugs. Yeah, low. That's all. Uh, that's all they were, and it, 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 they've made movies about them. They, they kind of give them the, the Robin Hood effect. Yeah, they, no, they, these they were they, helping the poor. They no, yeah, so. no, they were just two two losers, just going around yeah. killing innocent people. I mean, killing they've murdered people, thirteen uh, people. Yeah, staying staying high on drugs, killing people, yeah. and you know, torturing neighbors. They were thugs. Thugs. That's all. 
But yeah, this is the location. The store's long gone now, of course. Uh, but this is where the fourth murder happened. And six of them were law enforcement. I would always wonder what the real count is because yeah, who knows? we don't know what they've, you know. You know, you got to think in this time period in the early 30s, this is during the Depression. A lot of people are moving around. Uh, there's no telling what the actual count is and how much stuff we don't even know that happened in these small, you know, small towns. Because they would, they would pick at these small towns because there wasn't much law enforcement. Uh, yeah, and he, and, it, and he always stole a fast car. His car always had the bigger engines. Ford, than, the biggest engine they could find. Yeah, yeah. and they would just outrun, outrun each cops. cop. Uh, that's, that's how they always got away. Just just drove faster than them. And a lot of the famous ones was, the, you know, the car that he stole in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, was one of the fastest cars the cops couldn't keep up with. You, yeah. know, so. you had a lot of cop cars back in those days. They would even barely go 50 miles an hour. And this dude's ripping down 75, 80 miles an hour. Oh, so. yeah. Cops, the, the cops, uh, people don't know the cops, uh, the departments back then, they were very underfunded. So a lot oh, of their yeah. equipment was outdated. And outdated. Uh, you know, the, the cops are using, you know, like 32 caliber weapons. Clive's got 45. <laughs> He's got bigger weapons. He's got bigger, faster cars. Um, yeah. You know, you're not going to catch them. And that's how they got away with what they did for so long. Plus, the news cycle in the 30s, you're still doing, you know, Mostly, most of these small communities still use telegram, radio. There was no television yet. Yeah, by the um, time they reported it, uh, he's probably you know he's yeah, probably he's two, three hundred miles away. Yeah. That's uh, one of the interesting facts of Sherman, Texas. This was uh, a Clyde, Bonnie and Clyde uh, shootout took place right here. All right, so we just talked to a lady that lives local here, and uh, she stopped by and asked what we were doing. Anyway, she did not want to be on camera, but she told us that this was built in 1901, and this was St. Vincent's... Uh, sanitarium? Sanitarium, yeah. You believe there's a sanitarium right here. And uh, you could tell by the grand you know, entrance that this must have been a very large structure, and uh, we'll put up a little clip there to show you what it looked like before it burned down in the 80s. But uh, it was used as apartments after, uh, after it closed down. And a lot of sanitariums went, uh, went away side with uh, political changes and all. But uh, yeah, this was, uh, this was a sanitarium and really cool looking structure. I, I and if you go and lines. if you go over here, it's looking, you know, the, yeah, it just it stairs that leads to nothing. And this building was pretty huge. Very cool. So we went from wondering what it was to actually uh, finding out. And, and I love also, that talking to locals. Locals is everything. And we also found out that if you guys are looking to make Sherman, Texas your home, we have these lovely little apartments right here. Yes, yeah, the old Howard Johnson. Yeah, look at that 60s architecture. And uh, all bills paid, in case you guys are wondering. And uh, a one bedroom is $7.95 yeah. for a small one, and then $8.50 for a larger one bedroom. And then if you're feeling really fancy and you need a two bedroom or you got a family, that's $9.25 a month. All bills paid. All I don't know if it's cable. Probably not. Probably not cable. But uh, yeah, do we get water, internet? Do we get some internet here? You know. Yeah, maybe. And pay your own internet, kids. But I other mean, than that, you know. For that price, I would think you would get internet because this is pretty, uh, you know, shanty looking. I would hope you get internet. Uh, I I think the people here are nice. People are really nice, though. Yeah. Yeah. People are really nice. Just keep make sure you keep your uh, wallet uh, with a chain on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Hurry up, ma'am, you're gonna miss your train. All aboard. Next stop, Willoughby. Next stop, Willoughby. So that takes us to the, uh, the MKT. That's the Missouri, Kansas, Texas line. Better known around these parts as the Katy. And uh, what this did is this, this line here linked Texas to Kansas City, uh, you know, Missouri, the whole rest of the country. So it was really an important line. Now before this, like you heard of like the old 1870s cattle drives and stuff like that. They would actually drive these cattle by hand on horseback to the, the rail line, which was all the way in Kansas. So from here, that's, you know, 500 miles, four or 500 miles. So you're talking, you know, two, two three months to get these cattle because you only push them, you know, 10 miles a day. It's a long time. So this line actually opened up all the cattle industry from Texas to go to the east, to Chicago, to New York, and make beef readily available to the rest of the country. So a uh, very important line. 
So just across from the Katy Depot, kind of catty corner, is the Traveler's Hotel. And it didn't have any real significance as far as historical value. It was built here by the railroad, I believe, from what I, what I read, to house uh, both their workers when they came through town and also guests and bring people to this area of Denison. So uh, it's just got a cool creep factor to it. That's why I would stop and show you something like this because look at that, man. I mean, imagine the stories and what took place inside that building. I mean, it's been there since the 1890s, no telling. It's just, it's got a really cool look to it. So one of our stops today is gonna take us to the former site of the Supreme Woodsman's Circle home. And this home was founded uh, in the 1930s by a lady named uh, Dora Talley, Dora Alexander Talley. And uh, what this was is this was a home, uh, it was a revolutionary deal at the time. People didn't have social security back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, so she was one of the first people to sell women insurance. And what the insurance did was provide a home for orphan kids, provide a home for the elderly women. And that's what this was first built for. And it was a beautiful home. Now in the, uh, it was closed in 1971 because they were failing building codes, uh, a lot of violations and the city shut them down. So this was a, a home for like what, unwed or single women? Unwed, or? single, uh, you know, back in those days it was not, not good to be known as a divorcee either. So divorcees would come here. Uh, people, you, know, you were frowned upon if you got divorced from your husband. Uh, it was a home for women and children, basically. And uh, people, that, it would give them a way to not live on the streets. Uh, How would they pay for it? Well, that's through this insurance. So the, the Supreme Woodsman's insurance would allow them to pay in through the years. Kind of like you're paying Social Security now. This would give them a way to have a place to go when they retired and they're uh you know they're, let's say their husband died they're uh, on their own for the first time in their life they have a secure place to go oh so they're just banding together banding and then they together. all live together they're basically shipping their money together to have a place to live yeah and they tore this down when tore this down last year it had been burned several times so in the uh 71 it was closed down like i said for violations of code and then in 1977, a man came out here by the name of Dr. Ariel Sherman. Same name as the town we're in. Uh, was it was it named after him? I don't believe so. I think it was just coincidental that his name was Sherman. Uh, I believe that the town was named after someone that fought in the uh, Texas Revolutionary War. Ah, okay. If I'm not mistaken, that died in the Alamo. But anyway, the. Uh, this guy started what they considered a cult out here. He was some kind of religious uh, doctor. He had gotten in trouble, I believe, in Oregon for starting a cult there that was con considered a cult. And they said, you know, back in the 80s, it was real, this one was from 77 to 81. Uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons was out. Everything was a Satanist cult. And they said that this guy was a Satanist cult. Uh, a lot of it was kind of considered folklore but uh, it still was enough to get everybody's uh, suspicions up and the, the feds to come in and, and see the assets <laughs> and stuff like that. You know? so, who knows what really went on here, but uh, it was said it was be a Satanist cult. Okay. So that takes us to the birthplace of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th President of the United States, decorated five-star general over the European theater in World War II. Very, uh, very courageous man, uh, helped win the war in Europe. But we're here to talk about a few of the more darker sides of Dwight D. Eisenhower. So this is the home where the 34th president of the United States was born, right here in Denison, Texas. Now I'm here to talk about kind of the alien tie-in to the earlier story of the very first flying saucer being discovered in Denison, Texas. The president made, he was on a uh, vacation in Palm Springs, California. Ended up going to, sneaking away from his vacation, his golf course, and going to Edwards Air Force Base. Now, 
this secret meeting was with what some people say the Nordic aliens and these aliens were pale skin light blue eyed and their lips had no colorization and they were there to meet with him because they were very concerned with what America and the rest of the world was doing with our nuclear program at the time so this meeting took place February 20th of 1952 and then he had another meeting in 1954 but the meeting in 52 was an exchange for the aliens to give us their technology and their spiritual well-being uh, teach us what their spirituality was in exchange for our nuclear technology being destroyed they were very afraid that the world our country Russia was going to destroy the earth and if the earth was destroyed it would actually destroy their space-time continuum type that's the way it explains it uh, it messes up a lot of things in the rest of the universe and you know what what where did we get the technology for microwaves huh maybe so so huh? then, where did 19, this come from in 1954 he met with the grays okay the grays are not good from what i heard so who knows what happened during that one maybe that's how we got the microwaves and a lot of technology came around about that a time a lot of technology came think about all the rocketry all the stuff that came kind of into being around that same time period so do we have alien life i've never met an alien i don't know if you have buddy who do you think is holding the camera right now i have met an alien so yes aliens do exist folks since we were in the area i thought me and max would stop by and visit this woman's grave right here we're at the west hill cemetery here in sherman and uh this is nancy orlena krieger do you, you know, know no no story would be complete in this world without a trip to the cemetery of course you know how you know how i do it so this woman is uh, one of the few uh unsolved murders that took place here in the sherman denison area so on June 17, 1946, she had went to the Grayson State Bank, bank yeah. to get some money out because she a lot was, of money at that time period, like yeah. three or four grand. Yeah, she was uh, well, she already had three or four grand on her, and she went to get more money out because she was buying a home in the area. And back in those days, when you carried a lot of money on you, especially if you weren't used to carrying a lot, you would wear like a money belt. Yeah, so she belt. had a uh, she was known to carry a money belt at the few times ever that she would carry a lot of money so she goes to the bank and withdraws about eighty three hundred dollars and i believe that's the last time anybody's seen her alive now she never showed up home and the next day she didn't show up and her son's getting worried about her and they're looking all over for her in this area her son puts up a thousand dollar reward if anybody's seen his mom and it would be almost two months uh, until august 7th I, I maybe about 10 miles north of here or so somewhere on a somebody's farm these two farmers are looking for their cow who's wandered off and there's an abandoned well on the property and one of them looked in the well and they seen a uh, a body that by now it's elderly woman yeah yeah by now it's been it's very decomposed it's august up here so it's got to be well over 100 degrees oh yeah, yeah it gets hot up here and all along the red river valley is one of the hottest places in texas the humidity and heat's just atrocious august oh yeah and uh, the only way they were able to identify her was because her left toe had been amputated or it was missing or some kind of an accident so they identified her and they gave her a burial and this is where she lies and um they had uh, been looking for her murder murderer for about two years now they were pretty sure she was murdered because there was blood that was mixed up in the soil down in the well so they think that possibly she was still alive when whoever had robbed her threw her down the well, well. i mean this is an 80 year old woman so she's not going to wander off 10 miles north of town and fall into a well on her own if she's going to buy a house so obviously yeah somebody saw her with all that cash probably at the bank or whatever you gotta think too this is 1946 this could have been like some 
a lot of people came back from the war messed up in the head, you know, from the Great War. It could have been like a, you know, a soldier or something that was not mentally right. Uh, Maybe they seen the money belt so under money her. Belt, so I'm going for it. I gotta have that. You know? Yeah. Well, I like the idea of the money, the money roll, and like right now, I have the instead of a money belt, I have like the jelly roll belt. If I can trade that for like a money roll belt, that'd be awesome. That would be great. Yes, but somebody eventually <laughs> was arrested. It was her stepson Ernest Millsap about two years later he was arrested and charged with her murder uh, but it was purely circumstantial evidence at best because he happened to have lived pretty close to where she was found dead yeah nine times out of ten on a deal like that is an inside job somebody knows she has that money uh, rarely is it you know I mean it could be though somebody saw her at the bank you know withdrawing all that money but usually it's a family member or something like that that's they're like the, you know my aunt's old. I'm having that type of situation. You know? Yeah, twelve thousand dollars back then was what a hundred and twenty. Oh, it'd be like one hundred twenty, hundred fifty thousand dollars now. So he probably just clob her over the head and threw her down the well. But uh, they no build him. Uh, a grand jury came and no build him, which means they didn't file charges. So he went off to. Uh, you know, our our friend down there in uh, Galveston got no build too. So our, uh, the the guy that. Murdered Morris Black, so you know you know. Oh yeah, you yeah, yeah. Know what's gonna happen? Texas is kind of a weird place. They either throw the furnace at you or uh, or no billiards. There's no in between, no middle ground. Yeah, so uh, technically murders unsolved. People felt it was Ernest, but who knows? But uh, rest in peace to Nancy Orlina Krieger. Okay, guys, yeah. that concludes the video. A little bit about what I do. A little bit about what yeah, Max here what does. Do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, I enjoyed it. I had a fun time today. Cruising around, uh, grooving around, checking out all the sites. What'd you think about that video about the murder? You get a little jumpy when that car came your way, huh? Yeah, man. I mean, that, the car was creeping. I mean, creeping. And we're on a back road in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, we might be the next ones to join in line here with the, the just murder another, scene. Just another day in the life of. But I mean, I, I moved to this area in 2020, the general area of Texoma. Uh, I like it up here. I enjoy it. And, uh, yeah, I like it. Um, I I seem to be always here. Yeah, you seem to be here a lot. So yeah, no, I, I, li I like Sherman Denison right over here. It's uh, it's quieter than the uh, big city of Dallas. And, yeah. Uh, that's why I came out here. I, I got so tired of all the stipulations and all of the big cities back in, during the pandemic. I was like, I'm, I'm selling my house and moving. That's what I did. And here you are. Here I am. All right. Well, thank you for watching. And yeah. again, check out his channel. It'll be check the link out. in the description box yeah. below. When uh, eventually we'll see you in the next. Well, they'll see me again, and maybe see me, and then they'll see me yeah. if you subscribe to and then my down, channel. And then down the road, uh, you'll uh, see us together. I plan on a lot of road trips coming up, so by the time you see this, there'll be some footage on there that's yeah. recent. So yeah. So make sure you subscribe to his channel, and uh, without further ado, I gotta get out of here. I gotta hit the road. I'm going to Texas, All right, and All right. I'm heading uh, west. So. All right. Well, he's you're, you're going you're going west. I'm going west. I'm thinking like uh, Colorado, Nevada. Arizona. All right, we'll check up with yeah, him and we'll, see, we'll see what he does. Who All knows? Right. I may end up east. Who knows? All right, we'll catch up with you later, guys. Have a good one. Peace out. Peace out.